Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribe to the channel. Every like and subscription just helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Was that enough of a radio voice for me? Anyway, today's show is the penultimate show of my six part series of Australian wines. The first four were donated to me by one of my Instagram followers, Jason Carley. Shortly after I took my advanced exam last year, this wine, this wine, I purchased from Underground Cellar a few years ago, and it fits in with my studies. While it's not technically a testable wine, it's still a wine I should know, or at least the winery. This wine is part of my big group of Underground Cellar wines I had shipped to me in the first quarter of 2020. I actually have four bottles of this, and this is the first time I'm trying them. Not sure how I ended up with four of the same wine from that offer, but I did. Anyway. Darnberg is definitely a well-known winery. I'd even put them in the iconic category of Australian wineries. They make a wide range of wines at various price points. They're probably best known for their Dead Arm Shiraz. Not their most expensive, but definitely one of their higher priced wines. Before I get into this wine, let's talk history of the winery. It was started by Joseph Osborne in 1912. What's interesting is Joseph was a teetotaler. He was originally an Aussie rules footballer, he eventually joins the Thomas Hardy Limited Company and becomes a partner eventually. This winery is also one of the oldest wineries in Australia and Thomas Hardy is considered the father of the South Australian wine industry. So Joseph had a good foundation. While working for Hardy, he also secretly got into horse racing and made a lot of money. So in 1912, he decided to buy an established winery in McLaren Vale called Bundara. Over the years, the winery passes down the family line, and a marriage to Helen Darnberg in 1920 is when the name enters the family and the wine's history. In 1959, the grandson of Joseph, Francis Dari Osborne, launches his own wine label to honor his late mother. The distinctive red stripe we see today is born. It's a callback to his days at Prince Alfred College and the crimson and white striped tie he used to wear. He also created their family crest with the Latin phrase, Vinum Vita, or Vinum Vita Est, meaning wine is life. This is the reason for the fertility symbol at the top right corner and the grapes in the opposite corner. The website has a really extensive history timeline that I'll let you explore, but these were the salient points for our purpose. Darnberg's estate-owned and leased vineyards are certified for organic and biodynamic. They use basket pressing for all their wines, red and white, with doing traditional foot trotting for the reds. Very unusual in this day and age, I think. As I already alluded to about in their history, their website has a ton of info about what they do and a good overview of McLaren Vale. So make sure you hit that link in the description. I could probably go on and make a 30 minute video on just their stuff alone. That's my cue to mention that I've resurrected my merchandise line. I retired my 1337 wine line, but now I have my WWTV and hashtag outstanding line of merchandise. The hashtag outstanding line is all about positivity and is based upon my response of outstanding when I'm asked how I'm doing. I have polos, t-shirts, accessories on Zazzle. Those are really for the WWTV side. Check out this sweet logoed uh, t-shirt that I'm showing you a picture of. The outstanding line is all t-shirts. So far, I only have a small number of variations of t-shirts for both lines. With more to come, link below in the description, so please check them out. Back to what are we here for, wine. This wine does not reach the lofty heights when it comes to price to like the wines like Dead Arm or their other icon wines, but it is an interesting combination of grapes. The Aussies are known for playing around with their red and white blends and also doing traditional blends. Blending these two grapes isn't necessarily rare from what I can tell, but it isn't common from my experience. They are both Rhone grapes with Viognier, more well known as coming from the Northern Rhone. It's either 100% on its own or it can be part of a Syrah blend in most of the AOPs in the North. In 1965, it was almost extinct with only about eight acres being reported in the Northern Rhone. Over the years, the amount has grown, though I couldn't quickly find exact numbers. I'm sure if I could remember the official French wines website, it would be there, the, the far as the stats. 
I just did a quick search, but I can say that it is now widely planted in France with most of the grape being grown in the Languedoc and sold as Vendée Pay. It's also seen quite a bit all over the world. It does show up in some Southern Rhone blends, but it isn't the most common of the grapes for the most part. It's completely absent from the most famous blend of all time and the most complicated in terms of number of legally allowed grapes. That would be Chateauneuf de Pop. Basically, every other grape grown in the Rhone is on the list except Viognier. Yes, there are a few others that are pretty minor that are not on the list either. All right, so speaking of those grapes, can you name them all? Well, I'm about to because you know why? Because I have a script to tell me all of them. So these are the permitted grape varieties in Chateauneuf de Pop. Grenache, now you have Noir, Gris and Blanc, Mauved, Syrah, Cinso, Cunoa, Bourbonlanc, Roussan, Brune Argente, and also known as Vacarais, Claret, Claret Rosé, Muscadarin, Picadarin, Picpoul, Noir, Gris and Blanc, and Terret Noir. Know what else is missing on this list? You guessed it, Marsan, which is interesting as it's a common blending partner with Roussan, which is on the list. Northern Rhone white wines, not from Condru or Chateau Grier, are some combination of Marsan and Roussan. In the Southern Rhone, Marsan isn't as prominent, but it is considered a main grape in the Cote de Rhone white blends and also Vacaray. If you're able to find Marsan on its own, definitely check it out. It can produce some really delicious single variety wines. All right, now back to Australia and back to this wine. From the website comes the story behind the name. Many of McLaren Vale's vineyards are on free draining soils underlain with limestone formed by the calcareous remains of the local marine fauna. One such creature was the hermit crab, a reclusive little crustacean that inhabits the cast off shells of others. The Osborne family thought the name appropriate for this. McLaren Vale's first ever blend of Viognier and Marsan. Hermit is also an abbreviation for the French appellation Hermitage where the Marsan grape variety dominates on the white wine side. When it comes to how this wine is made, I'll let them also explain it because that's where I got the first thing from. Small batches of grapes are crushed gently and transferred to stainless steel basket presses. Fermentation is long and moderately cool to retain fresh fruit characters. About 4% underwent wild fermentation for extra complexity. 14% of the Viognier is fermented in aged French oak to add mouthfeel and support the subtle Viognier tannins. The Marsan component received similar treatment, but was not blended until the final stages of the winemaking process. All right, here are the stats for the wine. The Darnberg, the Hermit Crab, about 13 bucks US. 72% Viognier, 28% Marsan, aged for eight months in oak. 14% of the Viognier in used French and American. 4% of the grapes undergo wild fermentation, which adds complexity. Both are fermented and aged separately and then blended at the end. 13.3% ABV, pH is 3.33, total acidity 6.1 grams per liter, and the residual sugar, or RS, is 4.3 grams per liter. That would be also known as dry. Okay, let's get into the wine. If I talk to you about how I really like screw caps, I actually do. Woo, a little bit of pfft in that. That's kind of cool, actually. I get my little Corvin screw cap. You probably couldn't see it, but there's a little bit of like smoke or so. A little bit of pfft. I'm going to guess that um, that might be I don't, uh, some CO2 or whatever that they, they put in there or... Maybe not CO2, but they probably add a little bit of that just to give a little bit of extra preservation. So, and, and not to talk about another winery, I won't talk, I won't mention them just because we're just trying to be courteous, but um, uh, there's another winery from Australia that famously bottles everything in screw caps and uh, they put nitrogen in the wine to help preserve it. And then you're supposed to uh, open it, pour a little bit out, Put the screw cap back on, shake it, and that way it oxygenates the wine. Eventually, I'll do a wine from those guys. Anyway, uh, and they're they're another very well known winery. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. All right, so on to this wine. Now, one thing to make note of, and you you can see it in the overhead, is that there's a lot of bubbles in here. Now, the Corvin always introduces 
you know, the argon gas. Always introduces bubbles into wine. But if a wine kind of had a little bit of carbonation, in my experience, I, at least I'm kind of assuming this because the other two wines didn't have this much bubbles, that I, the other two white wines, is that there might be a little bit of extra bubbles in here. It's not a sparkling wine by any means, by any means, but there was a little bit of boop, you know what I'm saying? All right, so um, it's actually, you know, uh, I would call this a moderate yellow uh, color, uh, bordering a little bit of gold on the edges. But I mean, the color is pretty consistent all the way throughout. Now, unlike um, the Chardonnay I did before this wine, I don't really see any green in here, other than the, the actual green screen reflected, but I don't see like any extra green color necessarily. Now, I've, I've got the top down going here uh, with the uh, thing, and I'll see if I can, I don't know. Anyway, whatever that is from the above. All right, so on the nose, yeah, it really kind of smells like you can smell like a little bit of like, you know, carbonation coming out. So I get this little bit of white peach and a little bit of white flower. It's not highly aromatic, but I get a little bit of peach skin, peach fuzz. It's more peach than anything else as far as fruit. Really a touch of white flower. Maybe because I'm looking for it, I can, I'm getting some caramel, but that could be just power suggestion that I'm trying to, I'm trying to find things so I know what the wine is. I know how it's made, that there's definitely oak involved. I mean, it's a $13 bottle of wine. This is not like 100% French New Oak. So, I mean, it's going to have some oak characteristics, but it's not going to be over the top. At least it shouldn't be. Or and they do American. They do French and American, but even American oak, you know, it's not cheap. So it's not highly aromatic. That's okay. Let's just, means we just get to the palate that much faster. Bottom line, it tastes good. And that's the important part, right? Does it taste good? It tastes good. I get a little of that peach skin, a little bit of peach fuzz. Peach is the overriding flavor on this. There's a little bit of a, oh, the word meringue came, came to, came to um, mind. Not a lemon meringue, well, maybe, but maybe like, like a, you know, a fruit meringue type of thing. A little airy, a little fluffy, that type of like feeling, not necessarily a flavor. There's this um, nectarine, white flowers, there's a bit of um, waxiness or a little bit of a little bit of heft, a little bit of body to it. I'm going to attribute it to the to the Viognier. Viognier can come across as a little bit oily, not in a bad way, but there's usually like a broadness of 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 mouthfeel that Viognier can bring to the can bring to the table. A little orange blossom. I feel like I feel like it's aerating a little bit more. A touch of green apple, a touch of apple skin. There's, there's a there's a phenolic bitterness to this, so tannin. They mentioned the tannin. And Viognier wines tend to have a little grip to them. Not like, like a red wine, but they both have tannin. They're both tannins. They might be a, a slightly different, you know, polymer chain, but they're both the tannin family. And yeah, the acid does feel a, a bit high. I know I don't really have an acid. Uh, an, well, no, I had the acid at 6.1, pH 3.33. So here's what's, this is what can be very confusing. I'm, we're taught that Viognier is a low acid grape. So it, sh it shouldn't be high acid. But you know what? I've been drinking a lot of Viognier's. Not a lot, but over the past couple of years, I've had a decent amount of Viognier's. And none of them have been flabby or really super low acid. So this whole Viognier is a low acid wine. I don't know. I'm not saying it's a high acid wine, but this, this is moderate. This is a thing, moderate, almost moderate plus. The Marsan might be contributing to, contributing a lot to that. I don't know off the top of my head if Marsan is a high acid grape. If I took the time and figured out if it is or not, there should have been a little note. I do like the wine. I mean, for 13 ish dollars for under 20, or under even, under maybe even 15, this is a totally crushable wine. There's quality winemaking going on here. It tastes good.
and that's all that matters. All right. I mean, that's the bottom line, right? All right, so that's going to do it for today's show. Again, if you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe, and then tell your friends about it. And until next time, we'll see you later.